what I'd like to do today is just give you a brief overview um, from some of the questions I kind of got during the reception. I can see that um, there might be a little bit of, um, I might need to give a little background on some of the very most recent scholarship on Nazi ghettos um, that might help actually push against your definition here. Um, many of you, most of you are probably aware that recently, um, in the past few years, um, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum and Yad Vashem each independently undertook projects to create encyclopedias of the ghettos. And one of the things that came out of that extensive research, which researchers had sort of already been sniffing around and, and talking about, was that our understanding of uh, World War II Holocaust ghettos was uh, dominated by basically large-scale Polish ghettos, um, the large ones, Warsaw, Łódź, uh, Lvov, I don't mean anything political by any of my word choices here. Um, they're just what rolled off the tongue easily. Um, and um, that um, these were very large um, population ghettos with walls or barbed wire. They were um, enclosed and um, uh, movement in and out was very heavily restricted. What we know, and not just in the case of Transnistria, obviously, where it's very um, common, is that there were a large number of ghettos as well that were not enclosed. They did not have fences. They did not have walls. Maybe they're our hybrid, our bridge to the contemporary ghetto where, um, you know, there, the people could actually enter and exit. Of course, there were still restrictions like um, curfews and things like that, that that restricted movement in and out of the ghettos, but um, they were uh, there were open ghettos. And then there's a third kind of ghetto that I probably won't talk about very much at all today. They're the really horrific kind, the so-called destruction ghettos. These were places that existed for two weeks to a month, usually one building or two buildings where people were held um, before being killed. Um, and, and usually under very horrific conditions, um, but uh, uh, these so-called destruction ghettos, we have, for obvious reasons, because most of the inhabitants of them are, are killed, um, we have very little information on them. And there were discussions at Yad Vashem and at the Holocaust Museum about how do we understand what is a ghetto in light of the fact that we have these different kinds of ghettos. And um, I guess I was an early proponent of the idea that um, we, you know, there, there were sort of two schools of thought. There was sort of the German school, so to speak, um, which looked for identifying ghettos only when the Germans identified it as a ghetto. And then they're uh, and excluding things like Jewish residential districts and other sort of terms that were used for these Jewish quarters. When Yad Vashem and the Holocaust Museum start to do this larger project, they um, decide to include all of these other places. And I very famously got into a fight with a prominent German scholar whose name I won't reveal, where um, uh, he was trying to argue that Lvov was never actually a ghetto because the Germans only declared it as such about two days before they liquidated it. And I was like, if it looks like a duck and it quacks like a duck, it's a duck. Um, and I continue to bring out my duck analogy now at any opportunity because usually when I'm talking, people are really sad. So it gives me this much levity in my <laughs> uh, discussion. So um, I, I think though that the duck analogy is important because there are many kinds of ducks. They look all different kinds of ways, but we basically understand what we mean when we're talking about a duck. And I think the same thing is true for a ghetto. This is not exactly the most scientific or precise definition, right? And I know that's where we're trying to head together. Um, but um, ultimately, uh, you know, we have to keep our definitions of the ghetto a little bit flexible in order to. 
um, include many of these places. My personal litmus test as a scholar of what is a ghetto is if the people incarcerated in there felt that they were in a ghetto and experienced it as a ghetto, it doesn't matter if it was called a Jewish residential district or a ghetto or whatever it was called by the German authorities, um, that is how I personally define it. You can read the encyclopedia introductions, both from Yav Hashem and from uh, the Holocaust Museum to see their uh, definitions, and I've written elsewhere extensively on how I define ghetto, so I won't bore you all with this, but since that question did come to me, I felt it was imperative that I at least address the idea of these three different kinds of ghettos. I would even personally argue there's a kind of unique Romanian-style ghetto, but we can discuss that later. May I ask you, um, I, I like your idea of including the way the inhabitants of the area define their lot, you know, their mm -hmm. uh, environment. Yeah, but I wanted to know if does this mean the contemporary inhabitants of that particular place, or could it mean their descendants? Um, I usually would, I would, uh, I would think it would be the people who were there at the time. Um, but I think one of the stark differences is that typically the descendants are not living in the same space um, as where the parents live. So this idea of defining it later, I'm not sure that you have the same kinds of opportunities as you might have in a more contemporary um, time period or where people live kind of in an area. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I don't have a good answer. Yeah. It, it seems like an important component of your definition, and I just wonder I, I, how for, restrictive it was. For might me, it's about what does the serf, what does the victim who was there, <coughs> how did they, in the immediate aftermath of the war or during the war period, perceive it to be? Um, but also, it does have to meet that measure of. Was it compulsory? Was it a restricted area? Were there restrictions? To me, the important thing is not that there has to be a wall, but that there has to have been a forced designation of living there, and there had to be some kind of controls on keeping the people there. Do you want to delay? Okay. <laughs> so that was obviously not a planned part of the talk, but that's okay. I was uh, going to talk to you a little bit about why study food, um, or how at least I came to this question. Um, I think when I sort of started in the field, which was a million years ago, 20 years ago, um, there um, was a lot of interest in understanding German motivations, um, in under, you know, trying to identify when was the Hitler order, these kinds of large um, uh, you know, questions um, that are at the center of, you know, the functionalist and intentionalist debate um, in Holocaust historiography. Um, and I kind of came to the field and I honestly really didn't understand why that question was really important. Um, not that I didn't have plenty of professors who tried to explain it to me, but that was not where my interest was. My interest was um, in sort of a larger fundamental question of um, what were the factors of survival in, uh, during the Holocaust and what was the experience of victims? How could I um, come to understand that? But um, I sort of didn't buy into this idea that survival was based on luck. So I wanted to know what were the factors. And so I started with sort of one of the most basic, which was if you could get food, this is one of the factors in survival. And so I started on this sort of journey of trying to look at um, this question of um, how did one during the Holocaust get access to food? What are the various um, things that come into play? And connected to that, that interest in what was the experience of Jews during the Holocaust, um, uh, also there was this interest in how did that struggle to obtain food and how did that lack of food um, 
impact the um, internal life or the culture of um, Jews um, experiencing um, that hunger and that phenomenon. So um, that's how I got here. Um, so when I uh, first started this work, I focused on large-scale Polish ghettos that were enclosed. This is a photograph from the Wuj ghetto um, that was the subject of my dissertation and probably as all of you saw a little too heavy on the examples from Wuj. I know I actually originally had a little note in there in brackets and had more examples from your other notes, um, but I didn't get there. So, but I'm told I might have a reprieve there. Uh -huh. So, um, a lot of my paper focused on the closed ghettos and the structure there. Um, during this talk, I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the open ghettos to try and correct that a little bit. Um, and um, one of the things, though, that did happen with the closed ghettos was, um, and particularly the witch ghetto, is that when the ghetto closed, um, ghettoization effectively cut uh, the Jewish population off from um, the food supply. And so we see um, and the German authorities having total control in the cases of the closed ghettos on the entry of, uh, or at least the licit entry, right, the legal entry of food into uh, the ghetto. And usually the amount uh, allocated for these ghettos was well below what we would consider um, subsistence level for the population size. Um, and so we see a situation where we have this sort of artificial famine situation created <coughs> with the closing of uh, the ghetto, with the large scale um, ghettos. Um, in many cases, this then sort of opens a whole doorway into all sorts of illicit um, food access, smuggling, black market, um, and so forth, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, Nazi food policy. Um, as we can sort of um, extrapolate from um, <coughs> the fact that the Jews were enclosed in ghettos without sufficient uh, food, we, and from lots of other research that I'd be happy to share with you, we know that um, the Nazis um, consider Jews to be uh, one of the groups that was uh, not entitled to adequate food supply. Uh, they were considered so-called useless eaters. This was a term applied uh, to Jews. It's also a term applied, as you know, probably to the mentally and physically handicapped. Um, and it also appears from time to time in discussions about um, uh, Ukrainians um, and uh, um, Soviet citizens. Um, and so we essentially have a uh, man-made uh, famine because not that there was a lack of overall food stuff available, but basically um, this particular ethnic group was not entitled to um, adequate food supply. Um, so the idea was that if food was allocated for this unworthy group, um, the food would be wasted on the designated group. And a lot of you, anyone who in the room does famine studies, I know there are a few of you, you're all familiar with the work of Amarta Sen, um, who developed the entitlement theory. And one of the things that sort of always bothered me about entitlement theory is that we don't really have a, t a lot of room to talk about um, this idea that it's not just about um, having resources in order to buy food, it's also that some groups need more resources than other groups in order to uh, obtain their entitlement. And if you want some parallels, right, you could think about food deserts in the contemporary ghetto where you need, um, you know, more resources to buy fresh food or to get somewhere where you can buy 
cheaper, fresher food, right? If you live in the suburbs, you have uh, broader access. So we, we have this this issue. So, but uh, coming back to to my ghetto examples in, in this time period, right? Um, I have two very famous quotes. Um, I didn't even give their who they wrote them, uh, which I should have. I'm sorry, but um, I believe it's in my paper anyway. Um, so, but uh, it just sort of demonstrates the thinking that was going on in terms of Jews as useless eaters. So in Wuj, this winter there is a danger that not all of the Jews can be fed anymore. One might weigh honestly if the most humane solution might not be to finish off those of the Jews who are not employable by means of some <coughs> working device. At any rate, that would be more pleasant than to let them starve to death. So again, we have this concept that, well, we're not going to allocate more resources in order to allow these people to get by. Let's just kill them off, right? This right away sort of tells you what their value was, that only the ones who are able to engage in labor um, are valuable enough to maybe feed and kill off sort of the rest. Um, and then Warsaw, if one wants to avoid or at least reduce these subsidies, the following possibilities exist. Undernourishment is committed to occur without taking account uh, of the consequences. Again, there's this idea that, well, if you don't want to have to pay for food for these people who are not worthy of it, then we can just cut the food subsidies and let what happens, happens. So here I talk a little bit about um, how Jews have to expend more resource, resources to gain access to food. So um, in the closed ghettos, typically Jews had to pay the German ghetto administration for all of their food. Um, and typically the German ghetto administration applied a tax on um, the food that they provided for the ghetto typically about a 20% uh, tax. Um, so um, uh, above whatever the market rate would have been. So we see that um, there's already, by virtue of being in the ghetto, you already have a sort of 20% penalty on the licit food that is available. Um, we know that remuneration for work by Jews in the ghettos was um, paid paltry amounts, often actually in food stuff, I'm sure. Um, and so we see that uh, Jews, by virtue of where they are in the ghetto, have to actually spend more labor uh, for less return um, in order to obtain uh, food. Um, there were a number of, uh, uh, one of the ways in the, uh, the Jews obtain food, um, sometimes a little bit illicitly in some closed ghettos, but illicitly in the um, in a lot of the open ghettos was to sell off their valuables, to sell off um, goods, um, but they typically had to sell these items on the black market, especially where there were um, goods that they weren't allowed to sell, like um, furs or other kinds of, um, you know, hard currency, these kinds of things. And so we see that because of the fact they have to engage in this sort of illicit trade, there's a devaluation of their valuables. So again, um, as they're trying to obtain certain things, they're able only to get less value. So again, must expend more resources to gain access to the food. And then ultimately, of course, the commodities um, themselves were not only more scarce in the closed ghettos and particularly in the destruction ghettos where often food is not allowed to even enter, um, but in cases like open ghettos where Jews were able to trade on the uh, open market, albeit limited times typically, typically not, you know, early in the morning, which is the best time to go to the market, typically towards the end when you, you have all the sort of leftovers. Um, there were items which they were forbidden to buy, for example, um, meat was uh, very often uh, an item that was forbidden to be bought um, in open ghettos, so uh, food costs were higher due to the scarcity and in some cases the risk involved um, in smuggling uh, commodities or um, illegally selling an item to a Jew. So we basically see that Jews um, are paying higher prices when they legally buy food. They're paying much higher prices when they illegally buy food. Um, they have to work more to 
get less and their valuables are worth less than they would have been um, had they not been in this um, predicament. So when I, um, when I first thought about what I was going to write about for this seminar, I have to admit that I was actually conflicted about whether to write about this sort of culture of hunger and coping methods and um, this kind of thing, or if I wanted to write about something that's sort of near and dear to um, my interest, which is um, this question of the poor of the ghetto, the people who um, were already, um, uh, you know, um, food insecure when the war started. Um, for example, in the city of Wuj, 70% of the population relied on some form of welfare in order to eat. So these people are already extraordinarily food secure when the Germans enter. So it would be nice if we could all say, okay, well, you know, at the beginning of the war there was a little more food and less people starved, and then as the war progressed, um, there was less food, especially, you know, the winter of 42, um, and um, more people starved. But it really didn't kind of work out that way. Would it, um, there was really uneven hunger. What we see first is the poor of the ghetto um, suffering hunger and um, dying from starvation and hunger diseases um, in the very earlier portions, and then we see later on, especially in places where, you know, uh, the ghetto exists beyond, for example, 1942, we see, um, you know, the, uh, the, the better off of the population experiencing hunger. And to be honest, you know, there were ghettos that were open or partially open where people simply didn't experience hunger. So I, I should put that out there, that not every ghetto experienced hunger. I, sort of, this came as a shock to me because I had done, which is my dissertation, and I thought I was going to go work on Krakow and find hunger, and honestly, um, Krakow is predominantly, the Krakow ghetto is a ghetto of elites. They um, basically shipped the poor out to the countrysides. They left the elite business owners um, in the ghetto to help them sort of run the ghettos, and, uh, to run the Aryanized businesses and things like that. And so you really have people who, and the, the Krakow ghetto was open for a long period of time. So basically for a lot of those people, they didn't really experience ghetto uh, hunger until they were, uh, until it was transformed into a labor camp or until they were shipped off to Auschwitz. Um, so that was actually a, a shock for me as a historian to be like, oh wow, there are um, not just, um, not every ghetto experienced hunger, but also there are even like elite ghettos Right. And of course, again, there's also this idea that I know is a little jarring, this idea that there's poor people in the ghetto, that some people are poorer than others. So when we think of the ghetto, we think everyone's poor. Well, the ghetto makes you poor, right, because it forces you to expend your resources at a much higher rate. Um, but not everyone enters the ghetto poor, at least during the Holocaust, right? Um, and what we see... Um, is that those who suffered from food insecurity before the war were uh, the first ones to starve, um, and um, that we have a number of important factors in terms, and this is especially stark in Transnistria, right, of um, the, the better off and the not better off because the diaries are rife with them complaining. Those guys came in with money and stuff and good connections and everything else, um, uh, but I don't want to steal your, your, your thunder here. Um, so um, what we see is that a number of things are going to play a role in this. One is, of course, the ability to bring valuables into the ghetto. So depending on how you were removed from your home to the ghetto, whether you had time to pack, whether you were able to bring valuables or not valuables. If you were picked up on the street and just dropped in the ghetto, right, you're a lot less well off than, for example, the person who was able to bring valuables or even better, your apartment already was inside the ghetto. You know, if it was your apartment and it was incorporated into the ghetto, and again, although 
for the most part, ghettos were established in the poorest areas of the, the um, city. That was not always the case. Sometimes it was actually in a little better area. Um, uh, so if you're not leaving your home at all, right, that puts you in a pretty good position. Um, if um, you have connections to those um, who become, uh, who come in, into power inside the ghetto, whether it be you have family relations, um, even if you're coming from outside the region into a new region or a new area, if you have family connections, that can be extremely valuable. Um, social connections, friends, friends of the family, so forth. And also very important uh, in many cases, especially the big cities, is political connections. If you were an active Zionist before the war, if you were an active communist before the war, if you were an active socialist before the war, um, I could go through all of the various uh, Polish political groups from the uh, interwar period. Um, but the point is, if you had um, you had been a part of these political groups or the youth groups, or um, uh, you've been politically active, and you weren't actually on a targeted list, right? There's also that aspect of it um, because there were lots of lists with the, the head people to be taken out. But let's suppose you were like a good worker bee, and everyone knew you as like a good worker bee. Um, then um, you also could have good connections that could assist you in getting a job that would protect you, a job that would provide adequate nutrition. Um, for example, the work I just did on Heinrich Vogel, which is um, coming out uh, this year, um, he sort of vacillated between two jobs, one which um, provided him with the political connections to stay inside the ghetto, and the other one which provided him enough food. So he would sort of take that job for a while um, to when things seemed to, like a deportation seemed to be looming, and then when things looked clear for a little bit and he was hungry, he would go back to the job that um, paid better and paid him uh, in more food. And so sometimes there was sort of this uh, vacillation um, and also, of course, whether or not one had a job and what type of job, right? You could have a wonderful job uh, that you sat at a desk, but you got paid nothing. You get a horrible job where you pulled sewage through the streets, but you got a lot of food to eat, um, and you might try and vacillate between these again, right, uh, with different kinds of survival strategies. Um, uh, also, when, uh, you know, so one of the things we see throughout the war is that um, people's situations changes sometimes. Um, you were a refugee, sometimes you were the one with refugees coming in. Um, sometimes you had money, sometimes you lost your job, um, et cetera. Um, so we don't have the same situation for everyone throughout the war.